So why repeat it on my time? What time is it over there, Mr. Um, five to six. Uh, well, by my watch, it's uh, five after, so I'm out. Um, Mr. Eagles, I've been wanting to talk to you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no what? You were going to ask for a raise, I said no. Well, at least you're consistent. You don't mind if I leave? I've only put in 12 hours today. Go right ahead. Uh, give my regards to Geneva. Fine woman, Geneva. Much too good for you. Hey, look, boss, to paraphrase an old French philosopher, I agree with what you say, but I deny your right to say it. Don't be huffy. How's your novel coming? Great, I've been able to put in a full half hour of it. Your time or mine? Half! How what? Nothing ever happens in Walnut Falls, right? Scope this one out. Um. Uh, attorneys for the late Temple Gray reveal terms of will. Temple Gray. Sleazy playboy married six times and got sued for palimony at 60. Okay. The quest includes such items as counterfeit dime to his first wife and sunken yacht to the sixth. Great sense of humor. What's this got to do with Walnut Falls? Keep reading. Speculation centers upon a single bequest, $400,000, to a woman resident of Walnut Falls, Wisconsin, right in her backyard. Woman not identifiable among known wives or mistresses of the deceased. Name of woman according to Will, it, Miss Jenny Talbert. But name does not appear. Name does not appear in one of the false directory. Arnold S. Baxley, attorney for the estate, declines further information. More to follow. Is that a juicy one or ain't it? I know every soul in Walnut Falls. There is no one here by the name of Talbert. Of course, she could have moved away. Hey, uh, we got a story here. Where are you going? Carl! Now, what's the matter with him? I'll see his wife on to him. That's what I'll do. I'll tell her the minute he comes in, she is to Geneva. This is Augusta Teeples down at the plant. Listen, the minute your husband comes in, I want you to tell him to turn around and... and... Geneva? Not important, but I was just making a bet with Bud here as to your maiden name. Taylor, wasn't it? Oh yeah, right, I was close. Oh, no, no, sweetie, disregard the message. Something just came up. Bye! Holy jumping catfish! What? It don't seem possible! What the? But it ain't impossible. What? I don't know how. 
how I know. But I know how to be. If I love you. But you, you don't. No, I don't. But somehow I can see just exactly how I Abominable? Oh, it means dreadful. What on earth are you reading? Moby Dick. Don't you think some of the words might be too big for you? I certainly do. Some of them are as big as elephants. You mean whales? Why are you reading it? Daddy says it will help shape my style. Does that mean you're going to help him with this novel? No, I'm going to write my own. I see. May I read it sometime? When it's published. Daddy says a writer shouldn't get opinions from outsiders. It could, um, Inflates, influ influence. influence your style, that's what daddy says. Ah, oh, yes, I detect the influence. Hello, daddy. Hello, daddy. Hello, sweetheart. How's your day? Wonderful. I did 20 words. It's 20 better than I did. Now you remember me? Well, that doesn't right? Maybe you ought to. Why don't we go look at your outfit? Wait a minute. Amy, would you excuse us for a few minutes? I'll call you for dinner. All right, I'll be at the computer. You know why celery is so satisfying? It's the sound. All food should have a company. Imagine the possibilities for steak, for instance. I'll have to have a or by Beethoven, or spinach needs a Balinese orchestra. Or turtle soup, should be orchestrated by Dave C. Very good. Cheese soup flesh should... Uh... Stop it! Alright, what is it? With what? I was fucking you. Uh, I was thinking about how we met. Okay, it's first sight. Yeah, you were just a, another one of the actress, overexposed and undernourished. And you? You should pardon the expression, just another self-proclaimed genius. Too shy to do anything but snarl. I wonder how we fell in love. Mutual repulsion? That'll do it. We were pretty fast, didn't we? Oh, I don't know, a full ten days from introduction to I do? That's pretty fast. Oh, well, it's comparative, isn't it? I mean, all things considered, but can we something better? Ten months? Are you saying maybe too fast? Well, my love, spring it. The story came in with the wire service today. Something special? See what you think. A uh, sleazy playboy dies, a real chaser, a collector, lots of wives, and others. Sound familiar? Should it? It was a uh, corny practical joke for life. Since so Willie left a little bit of nothing to each of his lady loves. Except one. An ex wife? No. Ex lady love? Ex. Who knows? So, what did he leave her? $400,000. That's a lot of money. Isn't it though? So. So, I'm wondering why. Is this a plot point for your novel? Could be. Well, there are lots of possibilities. Such as? Maybe he really loved her. Maybe she was something special. Maybe. There's not when the Joker's name is Temple Gray. Be careful of those cups there, I guess. I'd like an answer. I don't recall you asking me a question. Uh, he left the money to somebody named Jenny Talbert. Does that ring a bell? Oh. Um. Is that your total comment? A moment. Jenny Talbert? It's a nickname. Uh, I never called you Jenny. Some people did. Do you deny that you know what this is about? No. Okay, then maybe you'll explain. I don't affirm it either. Look, my love. When the news gets out, I'm going to be the, the laughing stock of the town. My wife, that I've always been raving about, getting a $400,000 request from a collector of women? How do you think people are going to feel about that? I have no idea. 
How do you think I feel about it? Now that's a point that interests me. How do you feel? Lousy. I'm disappointed to hear that. What the hell did you expect? Well, it would have been nice if you'd been more concerned with the truth than with my feelings. Your feelings, not to mention my feelings. I'm really sorry about your feelings, Geneva. But do you know how I feel? I like to go out into the town and punch everybody in the nose. Every goddamn man, woman, and child. Yes, and their dogs and their cats too, for what they'll be saying about me. But what I got to know is what they're saying the truth or isn't it? They'll be saying you're crazy if you're going around punching dogs and cats in the nose. That's the truth. Don't play games with me, Geneva. You know what I'm asking. Does my answer really make a difference? I mean, you've already made up your mind, haven't you? Uh, answering a question with another question is a cheap trickery. I'm entitled to an answer. I don't think I'll ever give you one. I think I'll let the matter drop right there and never bring it up again. Mommy, was that Daddy making that noise? Yes, baby. What's wrong with him? I think he's in pain. What kind? Growing pain, they call it. Gosh, does it hurt much? Or maybe because of his age? Sit down, dear. We won't wait for Daddy, I think. We'll be having dinner alone. Punching you in the nose would help. The record? Hello? This is Carl McLaughlin speaking, husband of Geneva McLaughlin. Didn't expect me to answer, did you? Still won't talk, eh? Madam, you should see a doctor. From the sounds you're making, I expect an acute attack of asthma. But here, here, you can't treat our subscribers like that. Hey, don't worry, circulation will double this week, maybe triple. Around here, we say triple. Uh, I say triple, too. Those bunch of four Lincoln witches no more resent what I might say to them. The fact is, they feel better for it. Justifies their worst suspicions. Written it up yet? <laughs> me? You expect me to write the story? You must be crazy. You're a newspaper man, aren't you? You got a responsibility to the public. So write it up, lad, write it up! Uh, sorry, Miss Teeples, but you're gonna have to find yourself another boy. Don't be a sorehead, McLaughlin. I'm perfectly calm, see? How would you like to have this job? How would you like to have mine? I don't get your message. How would you like to be the publisher of the Walnut Falls record? Is that easier to understand? What the dickens are you talking about? I'm an old woman, McLaughlin. 
I'd rather spend my time playing bingo than standing off your demands for a raise. You mean you want to retire? What does it sound like I mean? You're a cantankerous cuss, McLaughlin, but you do know the business, okay? Buy me out. With what? With some of that moolah you're coming into. Thought so. First of all, that money isn't mine. It's my wife's. Second, I wouldn't touch it with gloves on, even if I wanted to be handcuffed to this rag for the rest of my life. <laughs> Don't you think I've got any pride? Oh, absolutely. Enough to make a prize jackass of yourself. Look, Miss Teeples, if you were a lousy door-to-door -door salesman, instead of a lousy door-to-door -door publisher, I'd say you had your foot stuck in my private affairs. Get it out before I kick your shin. Not before I've had my say. You're a fool, Lachlan. You've got a wife and a million. Home, a chance at security, and just because of a case of incurable bullheadedness, you're ready to throw them all away. I repeat, you're a fool. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. A successful marriage depends as much on overlooking as it does on looking. It's easy to be full of nobility and to pass judgment on things you don't know much about. What's hard is not to do it. How would you know you're not married? You simple buffoon! Don't you suppose I would be if I had learned that earlier? I'm a lonely woman, McLaughlin. I've still got my pride and some money saved up too, but I'm a lonely woman. Take my word, it isn't worth it. All right, maybe it isn't, but I make my own decisions. You know, Miss Teeples, between you and the telephone, I've had enough of this. I'd like to take the day off. Would you mind leaving that photo? I figure I'm giving it a four-column, page-one spread. I think that with a two-column story beneath, I could... Okay, take the day off. Take it and spend some time beating some sense into your empty head. McLaughlin, my offer stands. Think about it. Look, Mrs. McLaughlin, I detect firms here that are 
know my business, so I'll get down to what is my business. We have gone to considerable trouble and expense to locate you. I'm convinced you are the right person. So please admit your maiden name was Jimmy Talbert. It was Jimmy Talbert. I see. People called you Jenny? Certain people. Including Temple Gray. You admit that you knew him? No. You're not going to deny it? No. I see. May I have another? Please. They're very good. Look, Mrs. McLaughlin, you are a very seldom trying to force large sums of money upon people unless there's no other choice. Now, in this instance, I have no other choice, and you know it. So please, if you assign these papers, I will hand you a check for the full amount of the request, and that will be the end of the matter. I'm sorry, I think it will just be the beginning. Why is that? My situation. Ah, I presume we are in delicate territory. Very well. Delicacy is not my strong point, but I shall make an attempt. I take it that in actuality you are referring to your husband? Mr. Baxley, if I were to ask you to keep the money and go away and never bother us again, would you? Are you asking that? Yes. I feel as though I just fell down that hole in Alice in Wonderland. Customarily, I spend my time taking money away from people. I'm not accustomed to anyone refusing it, especially when it comes free of encumbrances. That doesn't. Mrs. McLaughlin, you are loading me with a problem. I sympathize with you, Mr. Waxley, but do you see one? I'm beginning to. Your husband, I take it, is suffering the pains of a uh, retroactive jealousy. You are quite perceptive. Then perhaps I can suggest certain compensations which may cause him to suffer less. Uh, may I be permitted to ask some questions? Please. I doubt he is completely happy in his present position, correct? How did you know? Because no one ever is. Does he have other ambitions? He would like to be a creative writer. Takes money. Or his own boss. Takes money. Do you see my point, Mrs. McLaughlin? I think I do. You're suggesting that I bribe him into overlooking my alleged past. That sounds crude. In short, to put him on the spot. When you say it like that, it sounds like a dreadful thing to do. It does, doesn't it? I suppose you should think alternatives. No, let's not. There aren't any. Well. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. It is? But not for the reasons you think. My husband, Mr. Baxley, is a wonderful man. He has extraordinary gifts of warmth and sympathy. Like many fine men, he's not quite full grown. I honestly don't care whether or not he takes the money. There is one thing I do care about. Yes? He has to make up his mind about me. Uh, Mrs. McLaughlin, if I may be permitted to say so, you are a most unusual woman. I don't think so. I assure you. In fact, if I had met someone like you in years past, it is entirely possible I would have married her. Instead of the one I chose. You're married? Divorce. I'm sorry? Three times. Oh dear! It's the curse that hangs over us. Us? Us lawyers. Almost everybody can find somebody to love, but hardly anybody loves a lawyer. It doesn't seem fair. Exactly! Aren't we like other men? Of course. Then why are we such pariahs? I can't imagine. I've often said, hath not a lawyer eyes? Hath he not Hands, organs, dimensions, senses, passions? Absolutely. And if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? And if you poison us, do we not die? Beautifully expressed. Actually, it's Shakespeare. I know, the Merchant of Venice. I forgot, you were in the theater, Broadway. Off. So far off you'd need a telescope to find me. But you had aspirations, you worked at it. Well, mostly I just took classes. Seems that's all I ever did, take classes. Acting, dance, singing. I'll bet you were good at it. Only average. <sighs> the theater, how I loved it. What happened? Didn't love me back, but dreams, you know. No, Mrs. McLaughlin, I don't. You don't? I've never had any. You poor man! Thank you. May I say that I find you extremely sympathetic? In fact, if I interpret my present feelings correctly, I believe that I am envious of your husband. It's kind of you, Mr. Axley. I think it might be best if we left now. I'll want to talk to my husband alone. Would you come back this evening? Of course. Uh, I'll leave these. You can look them over. Uh, Mrs. McLaughlin. Yes? I find this not easy to say, but if your husband should be so injudicious as to make the wrong choice. We would like to continue our friendship. You have an amazing intuition, Mrs. McLaughlin. 
And since I've been so bold, may I add that I hope, I positively hope. That he rejects me? Thank you, Mr. Raxley. I can't share the hope, but I do accept the compliment. May I say further? No, Mr. Raxley, that's all I can handle right now. I'll show you out. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you are hilarious. Why are you drinking alone? Feeling nostalgic. For what? New York. Pretty exciting, wasn't it? If you happen to like disasters. I think of it, oh, not as a place, but as a time of life. A time where you're testing yourself, trying to figure out who you are and what you're going to be. When everything is possible and you've got a million choices, but not enough good sense to make even one of them. You mean, uh, your life, B.C. Before Carl? <laughs> <laughs> it was such fun. Parties in the village, sneaking into the second act of Broadway shows because you never had the cash to buy a ticket. And those little avant-garde plays in downtown garages. Did you ever see Crap's Last Tape? Those tapes last crap. And those shoe boxes we lived in. Cold water walk-ups, five flights, bathtub in the kitchen. Complete with cockroaches, you paid them the rent. <sighs> Three girls, one good dress. Whoever had an audition got the dress. And pulling coins to make up one taxi fare. Oh, those darn New York taxi drivers get suited. Run you down and pick you up. And those crazy little jobs we take to stay alive. Handing out leaflets for the sex dens. Doing mine routines in front of the fountain at the plaza. And playing human statue for that new window displays. Gosh, I, I never did that. You were pretty enough. <laughs> oh, and the bars in Tribeca with all the would-be movie makers talking about Tan and Locarno and Sundance, you know, all the places they'd never been and would never go. And sometimes after you'd talk philosophy all night and drunk a lot of cheap wine, watching the sunrise over the East River. And the dawn came out like thunder out of Brooklyn, across the bay. And then breakfast on coffee and croissants at the rosary. You know, my speed was more full of sausages and mustard salad. You were a low brow. What do you want? Must I want something? Yes. You want information. Enlighten me, what about? Me? You want to know my complete sexual history, don't you? I didn't say that. Oh, you think you've been saying it all along. So I'll tell you, not about me, no, mister. We'll just handle the subject generically, understand? But I warn you, it's not very exciting. It's full of cliches, empty, repetitious, boring, like everybody's life is plagiarized from all the other lives before. Sounds like a meeting from your old book club. So you want to hear about acrobatics in the back seats of Chevrolets? Or passion on the poison ivy at summer camp? You want to hear about the college scene? Oscillations with wine and giggles in darkened rooms? You want to hear about all those misuse we make before we know up from down? Do you want to hear about making love among the watercress? Love among the watercress? But I'm wondering, Carl, in those crazy days before we met, would you lead a life unstained by any lapses whatsoever? Now you ask? That's the point. Now I am not entitled to ask. There's something else I learned in New York, Carl. There are lonely men hiding behind their money and their macho images. Men who collect trophies in public when in private, all I really want is one good friend. Are you trying to tell me something? I'm trying to tell you that a marriage depends more on the questions you don't ask than the questions you do. <laughs> you and Miss Peoples, she's on the ball. You mean questions like, are you going to take the money? The money is not important. You always say that because it isn't true. All right, it's important. I don't need to belittle it. It's all the things we could use. It's vitamins and groceries and a car that starts even in winter in Wisconsin. It's carpets under your feet and and warm air when it's cold outside, and cold air when it's warm. It's, well, it's money. But there's still something more important. Whether you have faith in me. Do you, Carl, because if you don't. What, goodbye marriage, hello judge? You want me to say take the money? It would solve our problems, wouldn't it? Get you out of working for that witchy old lady. Send Amy to a private school, only one thing. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you say take the money, you will not ask me any questions about it, ever. Well, my love, which will it be? Which will it be? How did you manage to get me on the spot? You are on the spot. It's your decision. You make or you break right here. <clears throat> and that stallion howl will not help. How can you call it that? It's so totally male! So I'm male, surprise! Well, surprise is that you're so immature! <laughs> you're calling me immature? Oh, it is Because you know how useful this money would be? You don't like the way it comes. 
Why should I be ashamed of the way you got it? The way I got it? You have just taken a running broad jump at a conclusion. Okay, then tell me. Don't you know about me? After nine years? I, th I thought I did. Are, are you saying that I failed at that too? You haven't failed at anything. What, then what did I've done right? You are not a failure. I'm the imminently successful editor of the Walnut Falls Record 6347. Oh, yes, Miss Tiefels offered me the ownership of the paper. By me out, she says, with the money you're going to get. What a great idea. Buy her out with your money? Your money, if you decide. My money? My decision? How the hell did this land on me? Girl, don't you see what you're doing to us? Don't you see why I can't answer your question? Because if you do, it will hurt me. No, my darling, because it will hurt me. I'm the one who will never be able to trust you again. Because you didn't believe in me. Carl, our life together began when we met, not before. And it will end the day we lose faith in each other and start asking questions that shouldn't have been asked. I hate that rolling about Look at me, Carl! Look at me! This is all of me that there is. I don't know whether you're wiser than I am, or just smarter. Feels like a Christian science reading room in here. What's up? We're all here, Miss Fargo. We're all here, Miss Falco. Now perhaps you will tell us why. 
Mind if I turn this on? Anna Marie Falco, time and date noted. Interview with Dr. Peter Bergman, Mrs. Iona Braley, and Mr. Anderson Carr. Also present, Miss Donna Braley, daughter of the aforesaid Iona Braley. The aforesaid Iona Braley would like to know why we are being tape recorded. To establish a record. For what purpose? That will depend. On what? Your answers. At the request of the county attorney's office, you have all come here voluntarily for an interview. Since you are being recorded, you may wish to weigh your words. Why should we weigh our words? I'm not sure. Now see here, Ms. Mrs. I have no objection to this, nor of my neighbors, otherwise I would not be here. But we have a right to know just what it is you are after. I'm not sure. You don't seem sure of anything. I'm simply following instructions. From whom? The county attorney's office. To do what? Conduct an interview. For the purpose of? For the purpose of an investigation, if warranted. Into what? A missing person. Do you mean there's been a report? Not exactly. Suspicions. On what evidence? Sir, do you know how the planet Pluto was discovered? No one had seen it. No one knew it existed. But there was no other way to account for the odd behavior of its neighbors. So someone investigated it and there it was. An interesting analogy, but we're quite isolated up here. I doubt that anyone's observing our orbits. There was a letter. From whom? Anonymous. Oh, uh, the prolific author. Malicious gossip. It happens, Miss Falcon. We live up here in relative isolation, which gives rise to curiosity. Four houses on a hill, three in an ivory tower. Four stone, actually. With a view to split infinity. Oh, she reads poetry. <laughs> Let's get to the point, Miss. This is. How do we address you? Malcolm. You are on a wild goose chase. Very likely. I have no objection to your tape recorder, but I do object to an interrogation which you decline to explain. It's not. Not what? An interrogation. This is merely an interview. Then I take it we can refuse to answer your questions. Of course. What answer would you like to give for refusing? Faux pas, my dear. So, there we are. Would anyone like to begin? Under that seedy exterior, there's quite a clever mind, isn't there? No. Don't tell. You have to be modest or tell a lie. But since you are clever, you must realize that this is a complete invasion of privacy. Further, that you have no reasons for your questions. And if we had any knowledge, which we don't, we are singularly and collectively too bright to be caught in any little traps of your setting. In short, you're wasting your time, so why don't you stop wasting ours? That is the situation, Ms. Falco. Why don't you pack up that machine and go home? It's a good one. Runs a long time without reloading. Anyone mind if I have a drink? Oh, thank you. I will. My preference, while well, ordinarily at this hour it would be a Campari soda, but since you all have so kindly suggested, I will have Shut it. up! Isn't he eloquent? What is it you wish to know? Our information spoke of a person who seemed to be in residence with one or all of you. A person? What sort? Large, small, male, female? I'm not sure. There was no such person. Not with any of you? Well, there's Dr. Bergman's gardener. I have a part-time maid. Mr. Carr occasionally has guests, mostly female, I believe. This person was a stranger. Ooh, mysterious. Now, tell us, Sherlock, what exactly were we supposed to have done with him? I didn't say it was a him. <sighs> um, y you did too. You said- You said. I warned you, didn't I? Male or female, there was no such person. I think there was. On what evidence? Now you were interrogating me. If there were such a person, he would have been seen. Who saw him, Miss Falco? When? Where? According to our information, he was seen down in the village. According to further information- <laughs> That's ridiculous. The boy never went down to the village. The boy. Why don't we talk about the boy? Are you accusing us of some sort of crime? No, sir. Then by what right? You can get rid of me by supplying a little information. Unless, of course, you have something to conceal. Damned if we do and damned if we don't. We... we found him. Found him? He appeared on the road. What road? The black top along the coast. What was his name? He hadn't any. Everybody has a name. This one hadn't. Surely you must have asked. He spoke no language. A deaf mute? No language, Miss Taco. No language at all. He had no knowledge, no conception of the world or of other people. He was like, do you know the term Tula Rosa? 
He was like a beautifully bound book in which nothing had yet been written. You found Late at night, we'd been to the city, a concert, and we were driving back. Actually, I was driving. There was a fog. You know how it lies across the road in patches? The driving is treacherous along the coast, black top, hard on the eyes of those sheer cliffs on the left. It was quite a strain, a strain on the nerves. Miss Braley was not helping. What's up, Mother? Don't like the music? Well, music. After all, we've had the best this evening. Charming, wasn't it? Bar talk, barber, Hindu, and I think Radical, just that little lad. So what's your complaint? I'm being poisoned. You should have gotten louder than last martini. Mr. Carr, I don't think you should do that. What's wrong, my mother? He's not only my lover, he's my friend. Is that supposed to shock me? No, no, actually to impress you with my wits. See, ordinarily, most people would have reversed the order, and most people would have said- Most people would have kept their mouth shut. I agree. Oh, he's offended. Irritated, my dear, there's a difference. So what got irritated? Your sense of decency? Of decorum. Of which you have a deplorable lack. Of which I have none at all. Neither here does the great poet, and Mother thinks she has, but it's really just false gentility. And you, Reverend Doctor. Spare me your sophomore wit. Sophomore? Hey, when I got the boot, I was a senior. Aren't you driving too fast? Anxious to get rid of us. Lord, I'm really a precious little fool. Why do you suppose we're so close? Oh, That's it. We have got to love each other. There's no choice. The word love doesn't quite fit your mouth. Oh, shut up, Quinn. Please slow down. There is no guardrail in the fog. Good idea, Reverend Doctor. Miss the next curve and go fly, fly. Watch as our lives are real before our eyes. Uh, like a bad movie. Everyone a star, you great poet, drinking of symbolism and similes. Mrs. Iona Bradley, genteel mother, despising her child like a toad in her bosom. Stop That's it. Donna Bradley, more slob and major disappointment, and Dr. Peter Berg. That's enough. Oh, aren't we a splendid little cast wife one were to see it on a marquee? That's enough, I say! I thought you'd be silent. What, Doctor? Or... Over the cliff? Good idea. Great climax. Faster, Doctor, faster! There's a beautiful curve just beyond the- Hey, look out! Oh, dear God! Damn idiot! You might have gotten killed might have killed us. What are you doing out in the middle of the road anyway? Well, answer me. Answer me. Damn it, don't mock. Damn it, don't mock. He's an idiot. He's an idiot. Wait a minute. <laughs> What's that? It's sage flower. It grows all over the place. I've got a funny feeling. I know him. Who are you? Who are you? Stupid? I don't think so. Maybe he doesn't speak English. Bist du Deutsch? Francais? Italiano? Italiano? He's only mimicking. Well, well, looks like we caught ourselves a moon calf. So what do we do with him? Was he frightened? In distress? No, no, quite the opposite. He looked as though... As though he'd been given the whole world as a gift. What's that? It's very old and very sharp. Oh, he's hurt himself! Well, it looks like your moon calf just got a lesson in living. Where'd he go? Go? Where could he go? He spoke no language, knew nothing of the world. He was like, as though he'd just been born on the road at that moment. Where did he go? He stayed with us. Us? With me. I'll take charge of that. I had undertaken to become his instructor, to teach him to speak, to read. He was wonderfully quick. What did you teach him? He studies religion, Ms. Saka. You thought that should come first? Why not? Who knew where he came from, how long he would be among us? There is the matter of salvation and of sin. He was difficult. You said he was quick. But frivolous, frivolous. When the subject is decent, he simply turned away. You refuse to accept obligation to understand that the book of life is kept in heaven, the record of virtue, of transgression. One must respect the accounting. 
Do you hear me? You're not paying attention. Look how beautiful. Very well. Who made it? It grew. Who caused it to grow? God caused it to grow. Do you understand? No. It is necessary to understand. Why? 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 There are certain things that you must accept simply because they are so. There is reason and there is faith. Reason is for their pair of automobiles. Faith is for the salvation of the soul. For that you do not ask why. Why? He mocks me! I must be patient. <clears throat> Once I was like you, barren of all matters spiritual, lacking faith. No, not lacking, denying. Living carelessly without thought of a consequence because I had no God. I resisted God. I resisted the idea of God. I fought the knowledge, the necessity of God. God is a necessity? Absolutely. But not easy to find, and when found, painful to acknowledge. There is a poem. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind, and in the midst of tears I hid from him. You see, there was the irony. By the very act of denying God, I acknowledged his existence. Still, I could not feel him. Could not feel the acceptation which comes from surrendering one's will to a higher power. Until on a certain day, I had a revelation. That epiphany which we all seek and so few find. Tell me. Are you sure you want to hear? My life was in crisis. I had encountered a time of decision, the sort which says, You've used up your options, you no longer have the privilege of decision. My mind was in turmoil, my spirit in despair. I could see nothing but a pit awaiting me. I walked the streets considering how to do away with myself. A light rain was falling and there was thunder. For shelter I stepped into a church. I had no business there, it was merely a quiet place out of the rain. A place to consider, to decide not upon the life I might live, but how best to end the one I was living. As I sat there, I dreamed, no, not a dream, it was a vision. In the vision I stood in a ruined landscape, a graveyard of ancient volcanoes and antediluvian dust. It was like being on the moon. When I moved, the dust rose to choke me, so I stood perfectly still. I felt paralyzed by fear. No, no, something worse. Horror. The horror of being finally abandoned. What horrified me was the appalling loneliness. And it changed. The landscape flowered and turned fertile. Clear waters flowed and birds sang. It was healing, serene. In that moment, my life changed. You found God? No. What did I say? You said no. I said no, but of course, why did I say no? You had it now. I don't know. Was it a realization? Yes, yes, I think so. Self-realization. What had I found? I found that faith was a sham. A trap for the cowardly, a trick for lazy minds. You are alone out there, on a plane of danger. You decide to have faith, then you get the comfort in the company. I saw that those who preach faith have a foolproof profession. They sell an article which you may not examine before purchase. You must buy it in the blind. They say, have faith, and happiness will follow. Question it, and you are evicted from the club. The club of the credulous, the believers, and once again, you are alone. There's the truth. I became a minister of God, but I never believed in him. I never believed in what I preached. Were you successful? Extremely. Why am I saying such things? Because they were true. 
I had misinterpreted my vision. My vision meant that God had failed. The dead landscape was the battleground of a lost war. His church had lost the war. His church had made property sacred, had exalted ritual in place of spirit, destroyed man's right to think for himself. Frantic with failure, God had sent his son to make things right, but in the end, he too was mocked. Wealth and power took command, ancient robes of office, signet rings of authority. His priests became attorneys in the court of salvation. No more humble houses of Jesus, but great cathedrals, white sepulchres filled with dead man's bones. What happened to the words he spoke? Hate not, love one another, do unto your enemies as they would do unto you. Simple words, not easy to accomplish, but not to be mocked. What is it? A rainbow. Has it happened before? Of course. You never taught me there was anything like this. Shall I explain it for you? No! <laughs> rainbow. I know you now. You are the Purusha. What? The Purusha. The doctrine of the second coming. I think I knew the moment we met, but it was so wild a hope. You must forgive me. All those years of deception, disappointment. Rainbow. I needed proof. I wanted to believe, but never did that quite. Until this moment. What? I don't know what you're saying. The way you came among us, not of this earth, innocent, as no one born of this earth can be. The veils lifting from your mind, revealing what was perfect, already there. I don't understand. Of course you must deny it. The world will attack. It will try to hurt you, to destroy. You will need a friend. Trust me. Let me be your friend. You are my friend. I'll be more your voice, your alter ego, your first disciple. Who am I then? God's pledge to man, the hostage who will set us free. Like a child. Do not deny me. Child crying in the night. I forbid you to deny me. You seek me outside. Why? Because I recognize you. Because you see yourself in me? Let me worship you. God lives in Let me worship you. No. No, you are mistaken. Let me worship you. Where did he go? He came to me. Speak up, Mother. Don't forget it's for the record. That would mean to you, too. <laughs> Not necessarily. But you live in the same house. We do and we don't. Actually, I live down by the boathouse, Miss Falco. For sanitary reasons, Mother considers me a contamination. That's not true. I only object to your excesses. Excesses? What a prissy little word. She meant I fuck a lot when and where I please. I don't wish to cry in family relationships. They're no part of this inquiry. That's an interesting point. Whether you have the right to pry into anything at all. I made a couple phone calls, Miss Falco. You must realize that whatever your authority, I have a certain shall we call it clout in this community as well. You are interfering with the legal process. I learned some things of interest, Miss Falco. You did mention that you were a lawyer. Very well, I am a lawyer. In fact, a criminal lawyer. My status I don't mean that you represent criminals, I mean that you are a lawyer who is a criminal. In the words of one of our more sleazy leaders, let me make myself perfectly clear. You are a convicted criminal and an ex-jailbird. I'd like an answer, Miss Falcon. You seem to know all the answers. And you are a disbarred attorney. In fact, you're something of a pariah among the known legal fraternity. Why were you disbarred, Miss Falco? I don't need to answer that. I think you do. Would you like me to make another call? Commission of a felony. There we go. What particular felony did you commit? I served my time. It's over and done. It's not over and done. You have intruded upon our lives and are making accusations of an intimate and accusatory nature which gives us the right to know who's asking them. My information says that you were once a 
a smart ass attorney who was not satisfied with the ponderous pace of the law, but goosed it along by. Was it bribing a juror? Technically, subordination of perjury. Hmm. What an interesting crime. It means the solicitation of lies, doesn't it? So they lifted your license and awarded you a stretch in the pokey. Was that all, Miss Falco? Suddenly the lady grows reticent. One should blame her how many of us have to include felonies in our personal CVs. Oh, weren't there some additional fractures of the law? I'm sure you'll spell them out. I will indeed. If you can believe this, my friends. Our Inquisitor carries a very large sitting upon her back. Past tense. Maybe. Maybe not. For dealing in illegal substances, was it? Not dealing. Using. Stay corrected. Our lady was not a pusher, merely a customer. Hard stuff. Rumor has it that you also indulged, Mr. Carr. Ah, uh, but I've never had the poor judgment to get caught. Some of your present occupation, Miss Falco, they throw you a bone now and then so you can keep some space between your navel and your spine. Any words you prefer, may I get on with it? This is one of those bones, isn't it? Make work to keep an ex-con gamefully employed. You've had your fun, Mr. Carr. I would like to get on with my job. By all means, get on with your so-called job. You said... I don't recall. The boy came to you? Do I have to? Um, go ahead. Let the lady earn her rent money. I didn't see him exactly. I just sort of sensed he was there. He looked as though he'd been running. As though some devilish thing was at his heels. He meant my money. Well, I had some, 
which wasn't exactly a misfortune, was it? And my properties and my children, call them assets or call them blessings. I say there's no difference but semantics. And what's wrong with taking inventory of one's blessings? Don't you agree? Twelve years. Every day of which I missed my son. Missed watching him grow up. <laughs> missed teaching, comforting, protecting, healing his hurts. More than missed him, needed him to be my good companion. But I never doubted that one day he would come back. And here you are. We'll make up for those lost years, won't we? We'll fill every day, every minute. You'll know who you are, and I'll have my child again. You have a child. I don't think of her as mine. She is beautiful. She is evil. If I were to tell you, but you're too young to understand. She hated you from the moment you were born. She would have smothered you in your cradle if she could. When you were taken, she was happy. Did you not have love enough for two? For a dozen. If, if they were like you, you were my child. Sweet. Loving. Attached to me. Attached? <laughs> you take everything so literally. But now I'll be your teacher. And you'll be my child always. I'll keep you safe from any ugliness. I'll stand between you and the world. The world is where I want to live. It's cruel and it's spiteful. All you need is right here in this room. So small. I won't let the world touch you. I won't allow it one inch past the door. Listen, Jonathan, I'm very strong. You know the most powerful force on earth? It's the bond between mother and child. Nothing can break that bond, nothing can defeat it. They speak of a silver cord that connects the two, but that's just poetry. The umbilical cord may stretch, but it never breaks, even when you're grown. And believe me, that cord is stronger than steel, stronger than anything ever invented. Never forget that. Jonathan, never forget that we are bound together by something stronger than anything ever invented. We are bound together? Like allies, do you understand? We're like allies in war. Together we can whip the world. We can bar bad thoughts by not thinking them, and we can bar bad people from the door. We can keep the world at arm's length and never let it meddle with our lives. But I want to learn from the world. You owe me something. All those years, you owe me all those years. I can't ever pay a debt so large. I love you. <laughs> love is a debt also? Are you implying that I'm selfish? Are you? You mustn't talk to me like that. I won't permit you to talk to me like that. No record. Of what? His birth. The record only shows one birth on a Louise Bradley. Not all births are recorded. But why one and not the other? 
How would the record only show one birth and not the other? Drop it, Miss Falco. What was the date of his birth? Drop it. I must insist, Mrs. Brady. I said drop it. Why? Because it's none of your damn business! Get on with your inquisition. children together. Good. No, Corina. No facing reality. It won't be so easy. People will want things of you. Like my mother. Things you don't have to give. Well, I will never want anything from you. It's a promise. <laughs> the sun's going away. It's okay. We'll gather driftwood. Build a fire. There will be stars. Find a million. Will there be a rainbow? Not at night, my friend. One day I saw the rainbow. Do you think I'll ever see it again? There has to be water in the air. What can I do to make you happy? Sing me a song. I'll do better. Without a sound, saying, You know me. 
Discover me. I'm here inside. Somebody, please. But I couldn't hear my silent voice. So after a while, I'd be saying, make love to me. Um, and they didn't, they didn't ask much and they didn't get much. <laughs> You wouldn't know about that, the big, the big bad sex express. You know, it's, it's, it's like a dance. All the moves have been rehearsed. You just, you just follow the music. Circle around and do to tone. We'll change partners and off we go. And, and it's like that. Time after time after time. Reach out for love and find you've been stuck with sex. Who be trapped by your own hormones. Maybe first we must learn to be alone. Yeah, well living doesn't work that way. You have to reach out and grab and plunder before somebody plunders you. You feel like you've been plundered? We'll be good friends, won't we? I hope so. Forever and always. That's a long time. You won't leave me, will you? You said no to make demand. I'm not demanding. Maybe, maybe I am, but it's just, it's just with you. I, I feel different. Like, like I like myself. I feel like I, I, I've known you before, a, a long time ago, and now you've come back. I, I, I couldn't stand if you were to leave again. You are, aren't you? Leaving? The world is new to me. I don't know why I'm in it or what I'm supposed to do in it. I can tell you what you'll find. A tax on every breath you take. A price on every minute. If there's a price I will pay, I need you to stay. I need you to be my friend. Let's turn to be your own friend. I can't. I, I despise myself. I want you to stay. I need you to be here. You said no promises. I can make you happy. I can teach you things. I want to know you yourself. Make love to me. No. Make love to me. So you can despise me too? No. No. Please, please, make love to me. I was considering. What, your version? If you could handle the truth. I know criminals and moral acrobats, Mr. Carr. That's my world. They're pretty forthright, so go right ahead and speak out. You, Miss Falco, ex con, ex jailbird, you're a statistic, Miss Falco. Right here in the column where it says articulate fool. I am no fool. You're something worse. You're an educated idiot. And you, Mr. Carr, poet or poser. <laughs> what do we have here? A slaying contest? I'm not here to argue, but to find the truth. Your qualifications for discerning truth, Miss Falco, are somewhere south of pathetic. How would you go about it? It's a ploy, isn't it? So you can get away with telling a story you've already got worked out in your mind? Don't bother, Mr. Carr. I will deliver this record, and people much smarter than I will understand it very well. So let's get back on track. You said the boy had been running? Running, yes. And then? Yeah, we went to the place where I live. You mean you took him there? No, he led the way. How did he know the way? I don't know how he knew. As though he had a rendezvous. Where and when.
fear the good doctor is growing senile. When I was young, my mind was like a bright, sharp knife. It could cut through all the nonsense we were taught, the lies, the fairy tales, the inventions that we pass for fact, all those ego feeders that enable man to think he's something marvelous. I studied religion and figured out what it was, nothing more than a primitive insurance for calamity. I came to see God, all gods, for what they were. Nasty, vain, bloodthirsty. Created by man in his own image. And I found them all pathetic. But when I finished, there was nothing. A vacuum. A vacuum is intolerable. Somehow it must be filled. I thought to fill it with my poetry. But poetry as well happened. A plea for alternatives. Words with the ambition to become music. I became known as the poet of mysteries. But mystery by definition has no answers. That's not enough. I want. I need. I must have answers. You think to get them from me? You know, as a phenomenon, you're not that unusual. There have been others like you, quite a few in fact. Strangers with no origin, had no past, spoke no language. In France, there was the child of Aaron. There was the uh, wild Peter of Hamlin. And there was Caspar Hauser, who they called the child of Europe. Very interesting, Casper, much like you. Came walking into the square of Muhlenberg one morning, barefoot, ragged, about your age, and apparently never seen another human being. So sweet and trusting. So much so that there were people who reached out immediately to protect him. On the other hand, there were others who only wanted to kill him. Why? Why? I don't know, because he was different. Anyway, killers had their way, and Casper was stabbed to death by a man never identified. Poor Casper. Yes, poor Casper. But you see, those who he fell among were fools. Quite as foolish as my friends here on the hill. They killed the stranger before they learned his secrets. But I am not a fool. You're here. Hello. What is it you wish to know? Answers. To what? Well, for beginners, who are you? Before you appeared us, appeared to us on the road. What do you remember? Nothing. Well, come on now. I woke up the edge of the sea. There was a cliff before me and the sea behind. There was nowhere to go but to climb. So I climbed. We nearly fell more than once. But at last I got to the top. It was dark back then, and raining. It was a road. The road was black and wet, so I mistook it for a river and I was afraid to cross. But I could see, on the other side, there was an animal. It was watching me. It had great eyes that seemed to light me from within. Oh, it was beautiful. A deer. There are deer on the road. It was beckoning me, saying, I have won.
wonders for you. And you remember thinking, no, it's a trap, you may drown. But, but then I thought, very well, you may drown, but you will know things you never knew before. So I stepped into the river. But it wasn't a river. It was a road. A black road under the rain. And I thought, danger, there is danger. But there are wonders waiting for me, so I knew I had to cross. And I started to cross, and I was in the middle when this machine with its blazing eyes came roaring down upon me. And then you were there, and the others. And that's all. I don't think that is all. I'm not going to tell you. I want answers. To what? The mystery. Which? There's only one. You think I know? I damn well do, so you can stop playing your little games now. You know, you won't leave here until you tell. I'll tell you what I know. Good. Tell me who we are, why we are here. A random accident of nature or of a grand design? Are we the kings of creation or pawns in a lunatic game of chess? Tell me who the players are. They're afraid. But if not, I'm even more afraid. Tr try me. What if I should say, not you, but the cockroaches are king? Do you live with that? Is, is that the answer? It might be. Hey, I warn you, don't play games. Your vanity is what makes all life possible. What if the truth should diminish you, make you less than the little you are now? Hey, stop it, I'm warning you! You are nothing on a ball of mud, flinging through the cosmos, that doesn't know you're there. I is that the answer? Could you fail with it? If so, I will tell. Don't! Shut your mouth! Get out of here! Out of my sight! Get the hell out of my That was the end of it. I didn't see him anymore. Are you sure? Don't you believe me? No, Mr. Farr. On what authority? Your anonymous letter? Actually, it's with quite good authority. I wrote it. Aren't you surprised, Miss Falco? Not very. Is it customary for people to accuse themselves? More than you might think. She's doing this out of malice. A silly, hysterical girl. Donna, you know! Oh, let you have done with it! If it is the first and last time in our life, let's be honest! What a great idea. Any of you like to begin? The boy did not go away. Late that night, we got a call from Mr. Parr. He said, come at once, to this virgin. He told me to bring this certain object which was in my possession. The boy was there. When we saw him, I think we knew exactly why we were there. I called you here because this concerns us all. We were all together when we found him. No one knows of his existence except for ourselves. Whatever happens here tonight, we must all be implicated equally. Understood? We're sorry, but we have no choice. See, as a society, we live by a social accommodation. An unspoken agreement never precisely to speak the truth. We get along in this world 
by not naming things for what they are. You broke that agreement. You named them. Out of innocence, perhaps, but you named them. And there's no turning back. The fact that you exist is a reproach to us. Bigger than we can bear. Let me say it more simply. If it is possible for you to exist, then it is no longer possible for us. You don't understand what I've done. That's the tragedy. It's not what you have done. What is my crime? That you're innocent! Did you bring it? You wore this around your throat when we first found you on the road. I don't think it was there by accident. Do you? Have you nothing to say to us? Thank you for the rainbow. You understand, we did not cause his death. We didn't even touch him. He carried the means of his own death from the day we found him. Do you understand? Oh, yes, you're saying it was suicide. Exactly. He cut his own throat. That is what happened. I'll ask once more, what did you do with the body? We buried him. Where? On the cliff where it overlooks this city. We thought that's where he might like to lie. <laughs> Where? There. Now? Yes, now. There's no point. Why? You won't, you won't find anything. The grave is empty. We went there last night to be sure. We piled rocks on the grave to keep it safe from the animals, you know? The grave was, the rocks were undisturbed, but the grave was empty. Like someone had removed the body? Like there'd never been a body there at all. You mean you weren't all superhuman at all? You mean you were just imaginative? No. No, it was one plus, but all four, no, he was here. Remember when we first saw him on the road? We all had the same notion. He looked familiar. Like I knew him somehow. I thought that I recognized him. Murderers! Hey, watch him, Miss Falcon. You know those accusations can get you. Murderers! The boy killed himself! That is correct, Miss Falco. Clearly a suicide. It was murder! You pack of yapping jackals! You committed murder! You took an innocent, defenseless child and invited him to cut his throat! Forced him to cut his throat! Well, you looked on in all your stinking respectability! Now just a moment, Miss Falco. He wasn't exactly blameless, was he? After all, aren't you overlooking what he did to us? And he tried to convince me that he was the Perusia, the second coming promised by the Lord God himself. Clearly an imposter. He was a thinker, just a thinker who pretended to be my son. Oh, I suffered that. You know what he was after? Financial gain. That is precisely what he was after. He told me he'd be my friend and then tried to take sexual advantage of me. There's your answer, Miss Falco. He's a con man. Merely a con man, Miss Falco. A clever one, I'll grant you that. I grant you that he had our, our complete pedigrees before he showed up. And he just knew where to aim in every case. For what game? We fed him. We gave him money. We took him in. We gave him clothes. I'm sure he was softening us up for something much more, Miss Falco. Much more. So you did away with him? No. My dear, you're not listening. He did away with himself. With a lot of help? 
No, completely of his own volition. He carried the means of his own death from the day we found him. You cannot accuse us of a crime. There, there was no crime. Maybe not at the level of the legal system. Maybe not at the level of any system. There is no provision on this earth for slimy souled sons of bitches like you. Anna Marie Falco, June 7, 2005, at 2.25 a.m. Pursuant to inquiry into a missing person, be advised that after questioning all four principles and having exhaustively pursued conclusions resulting from such inquiry, my summation is as follows. I know you are there, but excuse me, I do not intend to acknowledge you. If I should turn and look, I'd be opening a door that closed a long time ago. Call me coward. Call me anything you please. I am not about to open that door. If I acknowledge you, there will be consequences. More than I can bear. At bottom, I am no better than those others. I know criminals and moral acrobats. I know them because I am one. Corrupt, compromised, oh, let's put it plainly, I am tired and afraid. If I should acknowledge you, who knows, I might do the same as those others. I might commit a murder that I committed once before. So please, go away. Thank you for the offering, but I must tell you it's not what you think. All the little glitters are not precious, they're just fool's gold. At a certain time, like back when I first knew you, I might have been happy with that. Now I see it for no more than what it is. So, goodbye, my friend. What's to say? We knew each other once, but that was a time when all was possible and nobody was tired and afraid. Well, well no, maybe, maybe not goodbye. All things are possible, so maybe just au revoir. I'll try to meet up with you again, and who knows, maybe this time I actually will. The best I can say is that I'll try. I promise, I will try.
in summation that there's no presumption of a missing person. There are no grounds for further investigation. Under law, there was no crime. What's that show that um, where you eat? This is the show where we eat really bad stuff. Uh, What's that show? Yeah. It's like dare.